This lecture, What Big Buildings Can Do for the Urban Fabric, was presented at the symposium Shaping the City, sponsored by the European Cultural Center in October 2018, as part of the Venice Architecture Biennale. It was prepared by Wayne Place and presented by architecture school head David Hill and Dean of the College of Design, Mark Hubberston. Ventress Architects mounted a major exhibit of the firm's airport designs at the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale at the invitation of the European Cultural Center. In conjunction with that exhibit, Kurt Ventress sponsored a symposium on airport design, which drew innovative designers and thinkers from around the world to participate in that symposium. As part of that symposium, Professor Wayne Place was invited to speak on daylighting concepts for airports. Subsequently, the European Cultural Center extended an invitation to the NC State University College of Design to mount an exhibit at the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale of student design work generated in an advanced architecture studio focusing on airport design. The studio exhi exhibit was mounted at the Palazzo Bembo on the Grand Canal in Venice. The designs of many students in past studio classes were exhibited. Their contributions greatly enriched the exhibit. However, the main body of the exhibit was generated by the studio class of spring 2018 shown here on the balcony of the Palazzo Bembo with Kurt Fentress, Anna Maria Drugi, and Josh Stevens, who co-taught in the studio, and also shown as David Hill, head of the school, Mark Hoverston, dean of the college, and Billy Askey, who handled logistics and the exhibit design for the work of previous studios. Missing was Tan Nguyen, whose visa issues made it impossible for him to attend, and Parissa Giovanni, who was not present at the group picture. As has been the case every semester, this airport studio class is very diverse, in this case with students from China, Iran, India, Spain, and Vietnam. As an outcome of that exhibit, the Board of the European Cultural Center selected North Carolina State University College of Design as recipient of the ECC Best Architecture University Award 2018 for its exhibit, Future Airports, Global Design Thinking. The award was given to NC State University for contributing to the research highlighting the significance of airport space and the value of the experiential journey. North Carolina State University was chosen as recipient of this award from this list of worldwide universities that mounted invited exhibitions at the Biennale. The College of Design expresses its gratitude to Kurt Fentress, Joshua Stevens, and Anna Maria Drugi of Fentress Architects for co-teaching the studio, which provided an extraordinary educational experience for our students. We express our deepest gratitude to Kurt Fentress for encouraging us to innovate, be bold, believe in ourselves, and for opening doors that would never have been open to us without his active promotion of our program. We are also deeply grateful to the European Cultural Center for making this incredible cultural opportunity available to the world. All of this has been made possible by our generous institutional and cor corporate sponsors, Vernon F. Shogren Endowment, Vernon Shogren was a professor at North Carolina State University for more than 40 years. He left his entire estate to this endowment, which has been used to fund a, a variety of research projects and also made a major contribution 
to uh, making it possible for this exhibit to be mounted in the 2018 Venice Biennale. Uh, in addition to resources of time and information, Fentress Architects also made substantial financial contributions, as did Lycett and Associates, Structural Engineers, Williard Stewart Architects, and LS3P Architects. We're also deeply grateful to our generous individual donors, Eliani Lopez, Chuck and Greer Lysak, Mark Williard, Terry and Julia Yergin, Jeffrey Floyd, Bill and Tess O'Brien, and Michael Tribble. So this lecture, Things Big Buildings Can Do for the Urban Fabric, was prepared for the symposium Shaping the City. The lecture was generated by Wayne Place as the acceptance speech for the 2018 Best Architecture University Award from the Board of Directors of the European Cultural Center. Because of scheduling conflicts, Professor Place was unable to attend the, the symposium and give the presentation, which was delivered by College of Design De Dean Mark Coverston and School of Architecture Head David Hill. The video of their presentation is not yet available on the online. In the meantime, this video has been generated and narrated by Wayne Place. This talk is going to focus on ideas developed in two advanced architecture studios at NC State University. One on airport design, taught in collaboration with Fentress Architects, and one on tall building design taught in collaboration with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. For five years, North Carolina State University has been running an advanced architecture studio on airport design. Wayne Place is the professor in charge. The studio has been taught in collaboration with key personnel from Fentress Architects, primarily Kurt Fentress, Joshua Stevens, Anna Maria Drugi, and Zara Mirian all of whom are graduates of the North Carolina State University Architecture Program. We have also had major participation for Bill Sandifer, the Chief Operating Officer of the Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority. These people have provided the students unprecedented access to information resources, expertise, and insights into the intricacies of airport design and airport operations. Our students have learned a huge amount from them and Fentress Architects has hired many of our best graduates. Throughout the airport studios, the passenger experience has been a central issue, focusing on streamlining the flow process and providing more opportunities for relaxation and entertainment for the travelers. Efficient use of land has also been a priority. In this case, the concourse building, which you see here, allows free flow of planes, totally around the building, to increase the number of gates accommodated on this limited parcel of land, and also making airplane movement more efficient and safe. In order to accomplish this, Flyers arriving in the parking deck are allowed to move underground, so there's no connector that blocks the movement of planes on the back side of this building. This is the terminal building space, which opens up at the center of the building and subsequently leads to this concourse building. This is another project designed for the same very tight site. This design, which was generated by jo Jason Patterson, Michael Wengenroth, and Enzo Liao, took first place at the in the Fentress Global Challenge. In that same competition, another North Carolina University student design team took third place, and two other student projects were shortlisted. A design theme in all of the projects has been admitting ample quantities of good quality natural light while avoiding glare and unwanted solar gains in the cooling season. 
enhancing the passenger experience with ample views and a strong sense of connection to the outside world has been a major focus. Lofty, long span spaces that allow the traveler to breathe and find their way has been a focus. Innovation in tectonics and structure has been a major theme. Detailed structural design and analysis has been done to achieve structural elegance, logic, and efficiency, while also accommodating admitting natural light to the building interior. Several approaches to sustainability and life quality have been examined, including assuring proper solar exposure and solar control for, for all glazing, incorporating plants for filtering light and recycling air, photovoltaics for generating electricity, HVAC efficiency, and water management. The Research Triangle region of North Carolina is served by the Raleigh-Durham Airport, where we have a wonderful terminal, shown here, and concourse building, which were designed by Fentress Architects. The images at the top here uh, are located in the following positions. This is the terminal building of so-called Terminal 2. This is the concourse building. This is Terminal 1, which is a lesser existing terminal building. Currently, there is a giant parking lot uh, or parking deck here. In this case, the students proposed future expansions to the airport, which moved uh, much less heavily utilized general aviation where the private planes are and continued the spine and redesigned the spine down the center of this airport. So here there would be a new concourse building and terminal building and another terminal building and concourse building here. And all this development down the central spine involves um, an extension essentially of the city. RDU is an airport with major peaks in air traffic very early in the morning and late in the evening. This is mainly to accommodate business travelers on one-day trips, either coming to the Research Triangle area or going to other business centers in the eastern U.S. Even with the early arrival and departure, it is often difficult to put in a full day of working and meeting at the Research Triangle or at these other business centers. The assignment to this studio class was to double the capacity of the airport and to expand its functions as a way of enhancing the interface between the Research Triangle region and the airport facility. In this plan, the red roads and everything between those roads represents new development, incorporating a conference center, business facilities, hotel spas, and retail shopping. Having this facility right in the heart of the local airport will allow business travelers to arrive in the Research Triangle without the necessity to ar arrange ground transportation or a hotel. Me me meetings in these conference center facilities can begin essentially the moment the traveler walks across the bridge from the terminal building to the new conference center. This image shows a 3D rendering of the expansion of the airport, including the two new terminal buildings, two new concourse buildings, and parts of the new conference center, business facilities, and hotels stretching down the center line of the airport. This is another scheme for Raleigh-Durham International Airport with many new functions distributed down the central axis of the airport. Facilitating the interlacing of these expanded functions relies heavily on new security measures, which has been a major theme and a major uh, area of exploration for the studio. 
Proposals to substantially expand the functions of airports have been put forth for a variety of locations, including this one for JFK Airport in New York City. In that case, the facility was imagined as more focused on international travelers having a layover in New York City. It includes spas and a large high-end shopping mall. For the fifth offering of the studio, the European Cultural Center invited the airport studio to mount a six-month exhibit at the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale. The Biennale is one of the preeminent cultural events in the world and is often likened to the Olympics of architecture. The NCSU studio exhibit was mounted in conjunction with an exhibit of airport projects of the Fentress Architects at the Palazzo Bembo. And here you see a facade view of the Palazzo Bembo and then the interior view um, where the student exhibits were located. Global thinking was a the central theme of the studio. Each studio team chose a location around the world, researched the culture of the chosen location, and made videos about the culture. As part of the process, they had to explain why an airport was appropriate in that location, identifying what part of the economy they were trying to stimulate. Videos were also made of their final designs. This image shows one of the projects on display, showing the video being played on the monitor on the wall and in the foreground, one of the architectural models that the design team created. In this case, there are two models one showing the site plan and another uh, a piece of that uh, blown up in more detail. More efficient passenger movement in airplane operations has been facilitated in designs using drive-through airport configurations. In this case the idea is planes land from a runway, they come under the building and go through a series of stations. At station one Passengers disembark and baggage is offloaded. Then the plane moves on and is cleaned, then refueled, and then restocked with supplies and food. And finally, it moves to the final station where passengers embark and new baggage is loaded on. In this process, passenger movement is made drastically more efficient, allowing much, much faster disembarking when the plane arrives and much faster embarking as the plane is preparing to take off. Typically commercial planes have at least six doors, but in current practice, only one door is used for passenger loading and unloading. This is a digital view of that airport. In this case, there are runways coming in from the four corners and planes move through the airport and in the process never cross the path of another airplane or set of airplanes um, until the decision has to be made about who gets on the runway next. So the movement of planes is much faster, much more efficient, and much safer. In this case, integration of the airport into the urban fabric was accomplished by making the airport a major stop on the subway system. In Nanjing, China, the subway has very high security, so it becomes an integral part of the screening system. The subway arrives at the central tower, which is the main terminal, and the element that links all parts of the concourse ribbon that swoops around the airport and passes above the planes as they are driving through. This shows another drive-through airport, in this case for Wellington, New Zealand. The close connection of the New Zealand culture to the sea is acknowledged by an integrated terminal and concourse building in the shape of a manta ray. Moving now on to the Tall Building Design Studio. We are in the sixth semester offering a studio focusing on tall building design. It has been a collaborative effort with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. The depth of the team that SOM has made available is extraordinary. 
involving three design partners, three other project architects, and many structural engineers, two engineering specialists in sustainability, and an architectural engineer. Personnel from SOM San Francisco have made an average of seven person visits to NC State University per semester. In addition to the on-site visits, every review involves SOM personnel who participate by teleconferencing from wherever they happen to be in the world at the time. The studio class takes a trip, a field trip to San Francisco every uh, studio semester. That involves two and a half days touring crucial locations in San Francisco and visiting San Francisco architecture and one full day meeting with SOM personnel in their offices. That meeting sets the tone for everything that comes afterwards over the course of the semester. The studio focuses on the design of tall buildings that provide wonderful life quality for the building occupants engage and enhance the urban fabric of which they are a part, are efficient in the use of urban space, energy, and materials, and are economical for the occupants. In recent years, North Carolina State Architecture students have won several recognitions for tall building designs, including Zara Mirian, who took first place nationally in the American Institute of Steel Construction and the American Collegiate Schools of Architecture Steel Design Competition. Shauna Hammond took fourth place in the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat uh, International Design Competition out of 357 international entries. And Kelsey Morrison and Samuel Berner took first place in the AIA Triangle Design Competition. <clears throat> The, this particular design team was designing for San Francisco and they responded to the climate by trying to maximize cross ventilation as a method of cooling the building. In this case, they designed a thin building one unit deep, thereby providing ample cross ventilation through every unit, bilateral lighting, and 180 degree views of the city through each of the two facades one facing south and the other facing north. The cross ventilation enhances life quality and eliminates energy consumption and air pollution associated with the mechanical cooling system for the building. It also eliminates the first cost of that cooling system. Ventilative cooling is particularly effective in San Francisco where the winds are steady off the Pacific Ocean at temperatures that are suitable for ventilative cooling for all except a very few days of the year. The sleeping loft shown in this image assures ample cross ventilation with, while maintaining privacy and security. Units were also supplied with the option for sleeping lofts on the other facade. This is the initial version of the building structure showing the external diagrid that provides both gravity support and resistance to horizontal forces. The building is 560 feet tall and 50 feet deep in the shallow direction, which produces an aspect ratio of height to thickness of 11.2, which is above the proportions that are generally regarded as structurally efficient or economical. An exploration was made regarding the potential benefits of adding a greenhouse structure to give better proportions for resisting horizontal wind and seismic forces. So here we see that thin slab building as it was initially conceived, and then that same building braced by this sloped greenhouse structure. This is a close-up view showing the space truss on the south facade um, which supports the gardens and bridges connecting them. So all these portions that are showing green beams represent um, elevated garden spaces. And then these are the connectors that tie back into the thin slab building. 
This image on the left shows the midsummer sun angles. You'll notice that the depth and vertical spacing of these gardens is chosen to perfectly intercept all of that beam sunlight during the midday midsummer period. The gardens will be in full sun during all times of year, thereby facilitating efficient and effective food growth. The gardens will intercept all of the sun at midday in the summer solstice, thereby providing beneficial shading for the south facade of the building. And finally, the gardens will emit ample amounts of midday sun at the winter solstice, as shown here, thereby allowing solar heat to reach the south facade of the building. Structural analysis was performed on the thin slab building, shown on the left, and on the building braced by the space truss supporting the elevated gardens. The governing structural if issue was stiffness required to meet the serviceability criterion for lateral deflection. This was a severe challenge for the thin slab building configuration. When all the structural members were sized for stiffness, the amount of steel required for the thin slab building was substantially more than the amount of structural steel required for the entire structure consisting of that tower braced by the space frame supporting the gardens. In other words, structural material was saved by expanding the project to include the greenhouse bracing. It should be noted that this solar design concept would not work in urban environments where the building is surrounded by other tall buildings that would rob it of the sunlight required for the gardens. For the particular site for which this building was designed, the building had a large urban park to the south which would assure good solar access throughout the lifetime of the building. In this project, as in the last one, a slender building allows for cross ventilation. So the full depth of this building from the north to the south side is just as it is shown here. Again, there is a sleeping loft which allows for cross ventilation and still have privacy and security relative to people on this external walkway. Again, bilateral light is provided and 180 degree views on both sides of the living unit. The site for this project was a tennis club that blocked a major street that was part of the street grid. To restore, restore the street grid, the building was split into two slender towers with the restored street passing between the two towers. The two towers are offset relative to each other to enhance views, daylighting, and cross ventilation. The towers are laced together with huge trusses so that they are mutually bracing. The trusses consist of buckling restrained braces that absorb energy in an earthquake. As in the previous projects, this building design consists, consists of two slender towers, each a single residential unit deep. In this case, the two towers lean towards each other and connect together at the top so that they brace each other. Between the two towers is a vertical atrium extending the full height of the building. The prevailing west winds in San Francisco ventilate the building via the atrium, which opens completely to the west exposure and is closed on the east side so that the atrium is overpressured to drive ventilation air out through the living units. So this atrium space becomes overpressured and drives air through each of the living units on each side. At the base of the tower uh, is a large mall that engages the city fabric. In their design, or for their design, Kelsey and Samuel were awarded the AIA Triangle Award. This design also overpressures the core of the building by providing a wide opening towards the west, from which the overwhelming prevailing winds come in San Francisco. 
Public spaces and retail op opportunities are also made available at the base of this building. This is de a design for a super tall building in Chicago. To keep it from being too monolithic and overbearing, it was decided to build four super tall, very slender towers on four adjacent lots. For stiffening under wind load, these very slender towers were connected together with moment-framed horizontal elements. In addition to their structural function, these moment-framing elements provide horizontal circulation by, between the cores, thereby facilitating multiple means of fire egress. Floors for the living units were hung off the slender cores, providing views and light from three sides of the units. This is a rendering of that building from the Chicago River on the left and a physical model on the right. This is a rendering at the base of the building showing the free flow of space at the ground plane, expanding the sense of space in the city. The elevated retail mass with super graphics to make its purpose clear and finally a public green space on the top of the retail mass. This was design was for a very challenging site oriented 45 degrees off the cardinal directions and mostly surrounded by other buildings. The only significant sources of natural light are beam sunlight from overhead slipping down between the tall buildings and the south corner of the site where the height of the Transbay facility is low enough to let light into the building site. To tap into the natural light on the south corner of the site, double height communal spaces shown here and in the close up. were distributed up the south edge of the building. These spaces allow building occupants to enjoy the warmth and cheer of the winter sun, even for a site that is crowded by surrounding buildings. To harvest the overhead beam sunlight, the facade glazing was projected out, as shown here. And then mirrors were incorporated. These are tracking mirrors that reflect beam sunlight across the ceiling of the interior space. Zara Mirian took the first prize in the steel design competition with this design. This building was designed for a site called Wolf Point at the confluence of the three rivers in Chicago. The design team chose a cruciform shape to provide eight corner units per floor rather than the usual four corner units that would come from a square or rectangular plan. They tapered the building to give it a wide stance and to reduce wind-induced oscillations associated with vortex shedding. And finally, they gave a building, the building a twist, which had multiple purposes. First, to express the idea of swirling Chicago winds. Secondly, to express the transition between the city grid, represented by the cruciform building plan, and the swirling river currents representing represented by the twist of the building. They also did it to further reduce wind-induced oscillations associated with vortex shedding. Recreational and retail affordances were provided extensively at the base of the building. This is another structure designed for Wolf Point at the confluence of the three rivers in Chicago. The structure is rendered on the left and the physical model is on the right. The middle image shows one of the atrium spaces that are scattered up the facade of the building. This is the public space at the top of that building giving, giving 360 degree views of Chicago. This design was inspired by basket weaving where strength is achieved by using continuous mem members woven through each other. 
The normal rattan for baskets is replaced by a laminated veneer lumber for the building. This image shows the structural system and the physical model, which was very light, strong, and strikingly stiff. This is a view outward from one of the interior units. Ample recreational and retail opportunities were provided along the public waterfront. Shawna Hammond finished fourth internationally in the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat student design competition. In this design, the perimeter of the building was undulated and the interior spaces were sized to assure good daylight penetration to the center of the spaces and good views in all directions. Major retail opportunities were made available in the green mall at the base of the building. This is the view of the tower through the retail podium at the base of the building. In the face of all this concern about the urban fabric and life in the streets, we should not lose sight of the fact that when we create a building, our most central goal is to create wonderful interior spaces for people to live and work. To conclude, I would like to thank again Ventress Architects, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and the European Cultural Center, without whom this incredible opportunity would never have existed.